It's a conference where there's an attempt to sort of strategically link what we do uh, with the organizing work that we do, the ways that we actually put our, uh, our, our shoes on the pavement and like uh, try to enact our politics. So I kind of decided to do this a little bit differently than I usually do, which was to focus on um, visionary stuff. You know? uh, so in many cases, hi Virgil. <laughs> Uh, so in many cases, um, I mean, uh, in many, I, I don't want to suggest that visionary proposals are somehow separate from strategy or separate from critiques of capitalism and so on. Uh, but anarchist economics is, is really kind of interesting because there's some tensions around vision. Uh, so what I wanted to do was maybe describe some of those differences that we've had uh, in debates within the anarchist tradition over vision and then just open it up to discussion. You know, uh, so a few things to think about when I do this hopefully very brief introduction, although I'm known for being long-winded and I'll try my best not to say anything stupid so that Spud doesn't criticize me. Um, but uh, a few things that you might think about are, one, what kind of world do you want to live in? You know, uh, most of us are radicals or most of us are organizers because we don't want to live the kind of daily lives that we live under the existing institutional arrangements. In fact, we think that daily life sucks and could be improved upon, could be better in some way. Uh, this, the second question, and relatedly, is the question of strategy, which I think is incredibly important. And it's linked to these visions of, di of different societies, right? How do we get to that kind of world? What exactly is it going to take to get there? You know. And here's where we can have debates about, you know, uh, how our strategies link up with particular visionary arguments, which is this sort of larger debate uh, within, you know, a lot of existing social movements, but one that's existed within anarchism as well for a long time. Uh, there are debates over anarchists that have more revolutionary strategy, strategies, anarchists that have more sort of reformist-oriented strategies, uh, and. Uh, Anarchists who argue that expropriation and, and taking things from the people who largely own and operate our society is going to be necessary, or perhaps we can make moral arguments in some way so that they're kind enough to give us those things and so on. Um, and I'll try and do this in as unbiased way as possible, although I have my own particular sort of uh, ideas about vision and how it links to strategy and analysis and so on. Um, but first, a caveat. The, the entire idea of anarchist economics is an interesting one because a lot of people would point out that in the context of some uh, anarchist critiques and proposals, uh, the word economics actually isn't a very good fit uh, because the science of economics usually assumes certain things, uh, you know, like access to the social product, for example, being linked to how much labor that you put in. Um, or the existence of certain kinds of relations that we would describe as economic relations that some anarchists argue for abolishing. Uh, so in some senses, the kind of proposals that some anarchists put forward aren't, are, would be perhaps better construed as critiques of eco economics. You know? um, in some cases, this might be a semantic debate, and honestly, sometimes it irritates the shit out of me. You know? We kind of have the conversation, but I think it's necessary to add the caveat because anarchists are notoriously opposed to representation. Uh, so I can't come up here and represent anarchy and give some of the historical overview that I that I know. Uh, secondly, there has always been a strain within anarchism that's very, very suspicious of visionary proposals. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that some anarchists have argued that, you know, please don't even take my tea. <laughs> what are you doing with my tea? <laughs> uh, some anarchists, you know, they argue that these visionary proposals are possibly authoritarian. We shouldn't be deciding what a future society should look like for a future people that don't yet exist. If we want to create some kind of participatory world, then it has to include the participation of those people at this future moment or whatever. Uh, that's been one common critique. Another common critique of visionary pr proposals is within anarchism, going back at least as far as the Russian Revolution, there has been a set of nihilist politics that exist within it. You know, and, and, uh, many of these people have argued that anarchism should be 
shouldn't be about a positive vision. It should be a positive. It should be about negation. You know, it shouldn't be concerned with how the future is going to look. In fact, it should be uh, a a politics focused on negating the things that make us miserable. You know, and and uh, in the kind of society that we live in. Um, I think that there's a certain sense to those, those kinds of arguments, but I, I think they carry with them their own limitations as well. Um, finally, there, before I get into these sort of three major proposals, there's another proposal within anarchism that I've always found very appealing and very beautiful, although I think that there are limits to it as well, um, which is this notion of revolutionary pluralism. And Malatesta is very famous for this. So it's actually the, how many people have heard of Voltaire de Clare? Anyone? Oh, okay. Well, I probably can't teach you a whole lot about uh, her then. But she put forward the notion of anarchism without adjectives. And the reason is because she said, well, you know, we should take the best from all of these different tendencies and try and enact, you know, whatever, uh, whatever those particular kinds of politics are. Uh, Malatesta actually was really famous for pluralism as well, although he was a, an anarchist communist. He did have a specific vision that he wanted to see, but he also said, he also basically said that it's important to be humble. You know, we, we need to have a certain amount of humility when we make these kinds of, these kinds of proposals. Essentially what he was saying is, I'm probably wrong about some shit. And what that means is that I need to be able to listen to my comrades and have discussions and, and debates. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have opinions. Malatesta was certainly known for having opinions. Uh, but it does mean that there needs to be a certain elasticity within those kinds of discussions, a certain amount of humility, uh, because none of us could possibly guess from the existing society what some kind of future post-capitalist society might look like. Right? And, and these are sort of frames and caveats I used before I described the various proposals. And you can actually see anarchist economic <coughs> proposals for post-capitalism developing historically. Uh, the first was by this French anarchist named uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. How many people have heard of Proudhon? This is fucking awesome. Um, Proudhon essentially argued for a market form of socialism. You know, he, he wasn't a market abolitionist. In fact, what he wanted was he wanted uh, workers to organize themselves into cooperative enterprises. So has anyone ever worked in a co-op? You all get together and you make decisions collectively and so on. This is essentially what Mark Proudhon was arguing for. He said he wanted a future world without bosses and without politicians, but instead workers would organize themselves into cooperative enterprises and engage in mutually, mutual exchanges on a market. You know, Rather than a state, he saw us federating into this larger body, and he called it an agro-industrial federation. Uh, where workers could come together and under this federative principle and make decisions essentially from the bottom up. You know, so to replace wage, wage labor and wage slavery and so on, Proudhon argued for cooperatively ran enterprises that operate in a market um, that in, in some cases would be regulated by political decisions that were made by this larger federation. Now, of course, I said each of these are linked to various strategic proposals. And because uh, Proudhon was very pro-market, and because he thought of this vision in this sort of mutual exchanges, you know, uh, from cooperatives and so on, cooperative firms, uh, his strategic pro her strategic proposals were classically reformist. You know, that is, or Proudhon wasn't a revolutionary in the classical sense. In fact, he thought that we should use the market to slowly outgrow capitalism instead of to organize to overthrow capitalism. Right. Uh, so his argument was we would collectively put our money into things like mutual credit associations and mutual banks and so on. How many people bank at a credit association, mutual bank or mutual? How many knew that was an anarchist idea? A few well, can't get anything over it. Um, <laughs> there's usually some people that are surprised by that shit. You know, like wow, I didn't know that. But you know, Proudhon was actually he kind of borrowed this idea from workers in Lyon in France who were basically pooling their resources so that they could buy their own cooperative enterprises and to try and essentially outcompete capital, to to try and slowly overgrow capitalism, you know, and create a new society in this sort of slow market-oriented process, right? Now the next proposal that came along was from this Russian. Russian anarchist named Mikhail Bakunin. Um, Bakunin wasn't a reformist, you know, and in fact he was a revolutionary, and he thought of revolutionary in this very a revolution in this very sort of event-oriented uh, way. You know, so his idea was that we would organize the workers into, 
you know, a, a, uh, an international body, we would overthrow the capitalist class, overthrow those kinds of uh, relations, those kinds of social relations, and we'd institute a new economy. You know, and the ways that he thought about economy were based around concerns I think that a lot of people have, and in fact the questions that are often asked uh, people who make these kinds of proposals. So how many people have heard, like, when you, when you say, well, I want a different kind of society, how many people have heard something like, Who's going to take out the trash, or who's going to clean the toilets, or who's going to do the shit work? Almost all of you, right? Irritating as well. Right? Um, Bakunin actually thought that there could be an economic process behind encouraging this kind of labor. You know, so what he said was, actually, we might encourage people to engage in socially useful forms of labor by, you know, having uh, different uh, different levels of of remuneration, you know, basically, how are we going to, how are we going to control access to what we produce socially, right? So his first thought was, okay, what we need to do is have the workers control industry, and what we're going to do is we're going to produce and we'll keep things in a sort of common market, a collective market, um, and people's access to those things would be based on the, the, how hard they work, how long they work, you know, if anybody has ever read anything about labor time vouchers and things like that, Bakunin's ideas were very sort of along these lines. The Marx made very similar arguments, actually, if you read his critique of the Gotha program, where he, he, he talks about what he called the lower phase of communism and the higher phase of communism. He said in the lower phase, we might have these labor time vouchers, you know, to make sure that people are engaging in socially useful labor, but we may eventually be able to overcome that. You know, Bakunin actually made similar arguments. He saw this as a sort of transition phase, although I'm yet to see that written by Bakunin. Uh, I actually saw that read, uh, written by a friend of his named James Guillaume, who was a, uh, a French anarchist who was sort of trying to describe his economic philosophy to people. Um, there's a collection by Sam Dolgoff called Bakunin on Anarchy that kind of details all of this for anyone who is <coughs> as nerdy as I am. <laughs> I, I thought it was really exciting when I found this stuff, though. Um, now, with the mutualists, you can see their contemporary sort of, their, their contemporary uh, mirror, I guess is what I would say, in groups like the Center for a Stateless Society. You know, if, you know, if you've read anything by Kevin Carson or Sean Wilber, these are people who are sort of building on Proudhonian mutualism to build some kind of new theory of mutualism. I don't know many anarchists today who identify as collectivists as such, but I do know a lot of anarchists who uh, advocate for a, a form of economics called participatory economics that actually is very, very similar to Bakunin's pr proposals in some ways. I'd argue there are key differences too, and I encourage people, of course, to read about those kinds of things if you're interested. It, it's, it's a really interesting skip from collectivism into what eventually became anarchist communism. You know, which was the third proposal, which is a fucking crazy thing to say in the United States. You know, it's like taking the two most loaded words that you can in the world and sticking them together, you know. Um, I don't, I, I wouldn't suggest anyone go out and yell that they're for anarchist communism uh, without, you know, unpacking what those things mean to people. Um, but back in the day, it used to carry a lot of weight, especially among workers. I think it might be starting to carry that sort of weight in some places. Um, we don't have to describe those things from the ground up anymore, but certainly in the United States it can be kind of a wall to having these kinds of discussions. But a lot of, a lot of anarchists waited for Bakunin to, to die, essentially, before they started creating critiques of his economic philosophy because they had so much respect for the man. Um, Bakunin was somebody who gave his life to revolutionary organizing. And uh, out of respect, a lot of anarchists didn't start sort of critiquing these proposals until after he died. And I think the most famous uh, sort of uh, advocate of anarchist communism or anarcho-communism, there's some kind of weird theoretical differences in there, and I can talk about that when I talk about strategy um, for people who are nerdy enough to care. <laughs> uh, was a Russian anarchist named Peter Kropotkin. How many people have heard of Kropotkin? Hawkins is a super interesting dude. You know, he was a prince. He gave up his title. I mean, think about what that means. It'd be like, I don't know what to compare it to actually. You know, like Bill Gates, you know, Tolstoy giving up all it. of his wealth and yeah. joining Occupy. Yeah. Tolstoy, Tolstoy was really interesting, right? He was well, he was rich. He was super rich. Uh, yeah, I don't see it happening. <laughs> uh, 
but, but Kropotkin did that. You know, he started doing these studies of biology, and uh, actually a lot of the economic philosophy during the day was, was based on Darwinism, you know, or these faulty interpretations of Darwinism. The idea was that, you know, fuck animals are out there competing with each other, and it's survival of the fittest. How many people have heard that? You know, we're, greed, we're just wired to be greedy bastards at survival of the fittest. And on its face, that should be absurd because most of us aren't complete dickheads to each other all the time. Well, we have babies. What's that? We have babies. We do have babies, and we also typically engage in compassionate relations with each other, you know, fairly often. Uh, so the idea that we're wired to be greedy is crazy. What happened that was funny? Yeah. <laughs> fairly often. Oh. Well, I mean, sometimes we are dickheads, unfortunately, and that has to be accounted for. Um, but th the thing is, is that in his studies of mutual aid, he said that actually these biological theories aren't correct. They're not even correct about basic biological mechanisms, you know, regardless of what we say about economics. I'm talking about evolution. And he wrote this book called Mutual Aid, and he actually demonstrated how certain species of animals ended up evolving, not as a result of competing with each other and killing each other and competing over resources and so on, but actually ended up evolving as a result of cooperation, as a result of mutual aid. There was more to this Darwinian story. You know, in fact, the Darwinian story collapsed everything into competition, survival of the fittest, and so on, and made humans into these incredibly greedy creatures that, you know, are all out for self and so on, which is largely a ref us reading our dominant institutions and then thinking that our nature fits what they're encouraging us to do, which is to go compete with each other for wages in a market and try and fuck each other over. That's how capitalism works, right? Well, Kropotkin said, actually, let's look at this and extend it into economic philosophy. He thought that humans didn't have to be bound by economic activity, not even necessarily the ways that Bakunin put forward. So he was critical of Bakunin's uh, ideas about remuneration, he called them the collectivist wages system. And if you read his book, he wrote a book called The Conquest of Bread, in which he outlines this, this sort of philosophy, and he says that actually human beings will organize and engage in socially useful labor, and people will take out the trash and clean the toilets, he didn't use these exact words, um, without needing that kind of material incentive. You know, in fact, you can look at human social relations for at least 190,000 years, maybe 195,000, depending on the anthropologist. You talk, what do you think, James? 190, 195? Somewhere around there, right? Where we were Homo sapiens sapiens. You know, and there was this terrible term that economists came up with uh, that they called Homo economicus. You know, we, we had evolved into a different kind of being. Now we were Homo economicus, you know, and that we had to economize all of these human social relations, and Kropotkin said, you know, no, this, this actually isn't the case. And in fact, there are all of these examples of human societies having essentially free access to the social product, and in some cases not even having much of a conception of, of private property, not just in terms of, you know, the things, the, the places where we live, or the things that we use, but even in terms of access to, you know, uh, some of these tribal societies, and I, I don't want to make some big sweeping, uh, you know, sort of statement about indigenous groups, but many of them, you know, essentially had uh, open access to the social product, to the kinds of, of food and water and staples that, you know, uh, people, um, uh, people collectively produced, I guess hunted and gathered would be a more accurate way of saying than produced. Kropotkin believed that those, those kinds of principles could be instituted in an industrialized society. You know, that in fact it wasn't something that was relegated to the past. Now he didn't argue for us returning to a hunter-gatherer existence or whatever. He argued for instituting those kinds of values through this process. Now, I should be really clear and kind of careful here, because my own biases will kind of peek through. Kropotkin was a revolutionary. Okay, he thought that we needed to have a, a violent confrontation with capital in order to reorganize society. He didn't think we were going to, you know, hug and sing kumbaya, the, the means of production out of capital. He didn't think that we could go out and engage in civil disobedience and get beat up so much that they were like, we're sorry, here you go. You know, he thought that there would have to be a confrontation, you know, and he didn't like it. But he thought that it was going to be strategically necessary because this is how material resource operates according to his idea. But 
he wasn't event-oriented in quite the same way that Bakunin was. He saw it as a process, and if you read The Conquest of Bread, he talks about what he calls communization, this process of communization, which he uses it in a different way than contemporary communiz communization theorists do, but in some ways similar. I mean, essentially making common things <coughs> as it becomes possible. So when Kropotkin wrote about this in The Conquest of Bread, he says, well, we don't have enough beans to go around right now, so we will distribute the beans equally, tempered by need. You know, because some people are going to need more beans than others. Just think about shit like medicine. But of course, some people are going to need more than others, you know. You can't have some kind of perfectly equal rationing in that case. But he did say that we have the possibility of creating post-scarcity. That we might eventually produce enough beans that it could become a part of the common stuff. You know, that in fact, people could take them at will, produce them at will, and then we could trust people not to be irresponsible and so on, because we're not bound by homo economicus. You know, that in fact, we can create new kind of qualitatively different social relations, right? Um, I think the theorist that came after him was probably, uh, was probably, uh, was very influential on American anarchism in particular was, was this guy Murray Bookchin. He came up with this philosophy called social ecology. And he said that we could create post-scarcity anarchism, post-scarcity society. So in a sense, there were a few things that were linked here. One was that we could have free access to the social product, that we were no longer limited by homo economicus, that human social relations could actually resemble something different than the kinds of calculable, rational, you know, calculating processes that go into things like work, you know. But the other part of it was that we could create a new kind of humanity, where work was no longer a separate sphere of life. You know, and, and contemporary anarchist communists or anarcho communists also often say, we want to abolish work. And it sounds kind of ridiculous on the face of it. You know, they're always going to require labor. But what's meant by that is that work became something different than simply living at some moment in human history. And that we might create a future where work is no longer this separate, specialized sphere of life, where the economy isn't something separate from the rest of, uh, from, from simply living, and where political decision making as well wasn't something in this special, you know, this specialized sphere, separate from, you know, uh, from, from just living our lives essentially. You know? So you can see with it this position car carried with it something qualitatively different. In the beginning, when you look at Proudhon's ideas and you look at Bakunin's ideas, what we're looking at are arguments for how to self-manage work, how to create a self-managed society. When you started looking at these sort of uh, these anarchist, communist, and anarcho-communist positions, what you found weren't arguments necessarily for self-management, although that was a part of the a part of the process, you know, but, but arguments essentially for the abolition of work. This isn't very far from what Marx was advocating as well in his critique of the Gotha program when he wrote about the higher phases of communism. In fact, there's this Marx quote where he says, I fuck this up every time. Let me just kind of make it up as I go. It kind of goes like this. Um, a, a person should be able to bake in the morning, hunt in the afternoon, and criticize in the evening without ever having to be a baker or a hunter or a critic. You know that we might actually be able to engage in, in, uh, in sort of actively self-created, you know, beyond work as a separate sphere of life, beyond market relations controlling those kinds of processes. I think my biases are starting to peek through right now. Um, I should probably stop there. But again, I think part of the criticism of this more sort of anarchist communist ideal has been that there are questions about the limits of post-scarcity that I think are fair questions. There are questions about how labor gets done that I think are fair questions. These are things that, that Bakunin and that Proudhon were, were trying essentially to, uh, to, to grapple with. You know? And I, I think that they're fair debates. I, I have opinions on those things, but uh, like Malatesta, I think that it's best to, to approach those kinds of things with humility. You know? But again, probably because I'm probably wrong about some shit. You know, I think all of us are probably wrong about some shit. That is just kind of the best way of looking at, at, um, at vision and strategy as well. One last thing I should mention. I talked about these sort of modern day mirrors of collectivism and uh, mutualism. The modern day mirrors of anarchist communism and anarcho-communism are kind of all over the place. 
You know, it's impossible to create a monolithic block out of them. There are anarchist communists who are platformists, for example, who argue for formal organizations where they create and develop theory together and intervene in social movements. You know, there are insurrectionary communists who basically are opposed to formal organizations and think that informal networks actually are better ways of creating, you know, groups of revolutionary minorities. Uh, there are contemporary anarchist communists that sort of view technology as this neutral thing, and there are some who have developed a critique of, of civilization, um, or, or, of, uh, or at least of capitalist technology. I guess there are a few that are kind of opposed to technology as such, but I, I don't think that that grouping is very large, you know. Uh, but there are groups that argue that, you know, that, that the role of technology in capitalist society creates certain kinds of technologies. You know, and then that we have to have an analysis of those kinds of things and oftentimes articulate their politics in, in those kinds of ways. Uh, so I don't want to try and create this sort of monolithic block out of uh, libertarian communists. Um, but they do share some values in common, which is their post-revolutionary vision. Okay, so three big questions. What kind of world do you want to live in? Um, how do we get there? Big fucking questions, right? <laughs> we have 30 minutes to do this, right? Um, wait, how long do we have? 22 o'clock. Shit. 26 minutes to do this. And what are the limits? You know, the question of limits really interests me right now. Um, but uh, I, I would open it for anyone who has any kind of question or anything that they want to, you know, sort of clarify or ask, but also. I'd like to know what your opinions are on those those larger questions because I think they have direct effects on how we organize and how we intervene in the world. So I'll take a stack. One, two, three. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to keep it soft by um, saying that I really feel like um, uh, anarchist economics is not about the macro economy, but it's about the micro economy and meeting the basic needs for food, shelter, your the things that you need every day to live. And I feel like truly getting uh, um, freedom is our ability to meet these uh, independent, to achieve economic independence in these areas and, um, and not be dependent on wage slavery or these large industrial systems to, to meet these needs. Uh, I, I feel like it's it's a combination of microeconomics and scale that is the key. That's really interesting. Is everyone cool with me taking like a few at a time and then making some comments? And take, is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Okay. Mark? Sure. Um, given how some of the these theorists were very affected by the historical period they lived in and the economies they lived in, just as we are in ours. Um, and the fact that uh, these early theories of communism were in a context that was before consumer society and before environmental awareness of the limitations of the Earth's resources, how do you think those factors affect the modern uh, communist interpretation? Uh, my, my question was exactly the same as Mark's. I'm thinking particularly of the example of India, where the very real reality is that people not having enough access to water, perhaps even within 30 years plays into the idea of an ideal vision of the post I think there are a number of, if I can take these three and then move on, I think that there are a number of problems with assumptions of post-scarcity, not just at the level of sort of what exists, but also on uh, possibilities of natural disasters and, and things like that, which would necessarily create scarcity in some kinds of situations, you know. Uh, I mean, it's probably obvious that I tend towards anarchist communists, sort of, you know, insurrectionary communist uh, politics in some sense when it comes to these sort of visionary uh, questions. But those are the kinds of questions that really vex me, you know. Uh, personally, I don't think that there are clear answers to those kinds of things. I don't think that it's necessary to institute compulsory labor through remunerative norms to address it. I think that we might be able to do it through rationing and again tempered by need. Um, but there are larger questions about luxury goods or things like vacations to Spain. Yeah, the fuck, free access? You know, like, a, um, what's that going to look like? Um, and, and those are fair questions that I don't have clear answers to, to be honest with you. Uh, 
In fact, I'm probably a lot more comfortable talking about process than, than in results. Now, one thing that you said, though, I think challenges this idea of local economies, too, because we live in a global integrated system. If, India, if, if there are people in India who don't have access to water, then that means they're going to have to rely on people outside of that locale, uh, which creates a sort of challenge to you know, the local alternatives, uh, which I think a lot of people sort of think about uh, post-capitalist e economics in that sense, certainly for gun movement. Uh, which is a, a, an interesting and larger discussion. Can I take a few more? Yeah. You, and then James, and then... Mm -hmm. I just want to challenge um, the anthropocentric view mm -hmm. of economics and think about, you know, we're talking about <clears throat> what do we need from water? What does water we need from us? So how can we have, Thank like, a, a, <clears throat> how can we take care of the resources that are giving us things? So, you know, and I think that that gives insight into how we treat each other. Um, but like, like, how do we give back to the things that we're taking from humans and not humans? Mm -hmm. James? I just wanted to comment on um, kind of the, the local micro kind of econ question as well. And I think um, things like water and natural resources and geography is definitely a big part of the question. But another thing, I mean, we live in a, con uh, you know, in the contemporary world we live in, there's people who also need, you know, things like insulin and antibiotics and, uh, you know, um, able to, able abilities for transportation, and people who are uh, born with sight impairments or healing impairments and have, you know, things that we produce on an industrial level in order for them to live um, more enriched lives so that they can hear or see or move around in a better way. I mean, I think it's a really important question. Like, I think the local, like kind of the micro local stuff is great, but we also need to talk about then, okay, well, how do we produce these goods that are making people's lives better that we produce in problematic industrial ways now in a way that is it that is sustainable and not fucked up. Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean people are born with, you know, things like, you know, a child onset diabetes and you know, you know, I don't have to explain these things, but like and pharmaceuticals and, you know, those kind of technologies take a lot of capital at least as we have them now to produce and are produced with specialized training and the expertise to do that stuff and yeah so these, these two it's are interconnected these two <laughs> questions are without a doubt so well my main thing is i think until we can uh, free ourselves from the slavery of the almighty dollar and uh, and mainstream currencies that will always be enslaved now, what I'm in favor of is like multiple, full spectrum of currencies and exchange values that we set up upon ourselves. And just tons of kinds, you know, like timeshares. Anyway, anything imaginable that we can exchange currency and share it. And, and also, you know, things of value, anyway, all kinds. And that's what we should be working towards, always finding how can we exchange this? How can we figure out a symbol, a way, a coin, you know, whatever to do that? And that as we do that, then we abandon, you know, the Almighty. We'll find ourselves more and more free and mutually sustained. You know, this was very similar to, uh, to Proudhon's ideas. And there are people who are instituting those kinds of things now. In fact, one of the women who wrote a chapter for the book was named Carolyn Kaltefleider, and she writes about Ithaca Hours, which is essentially a local currency that they created to try and create a sort of counter economy or whatever. Many kinds. With rigid and heavily policed, you know, categories for sexuality, for gender, uh, the ways that, you know, a, a racism and class exploitation have sort of been woven into our social fabric are directly related to the ways that we, uh, we come to think about the, the entire non-human world, essentially. Uh, I, I actually think he has a point, and that you do too, both of them. I'm, I always think about wheelchairs, you know? So there's these anarchists who are like, oh, I've imposed a mass production, it's alienating. You know, I don't think I want to live in a fucking world without mass-produced wheelchairs, you know, unless there's a way of producing them in some other way, you know, that... And that's that, a question that we have to... Exactly, and that, those are the kinds of needs that need to be accounted for when we have those larger questions, and unfortunately those kinds of tough guys sweeping, you know, let's get rid of all this shit statements don't uh, sort of account for the complexities and nuances of, of uh, people who have those kinds of needs. Uh, you, you, and you.
Yeah, just to go further on the, the problematic notion of post scarcity, I think the, the reason that we, or let me say a reason that we have wound up at a place where we can contemplate post scarcity is that capitalist economics has been totally oriented around efficiency. And I think it's a wide open question what that ends up looking like if you don't have an economy that's oriented around efficiency. And I think so much of our critique of capitalism ultimately goes towards that efficiency fetishism and all of the things that have to be done to human beings and to natural systems and, and everything to produce that. And I, I just think we have no idea what, how much of anything we're gonna produce. And that's what makes it so hard to think about. Add into that the fact that, that all of that production has been fueled by ever increasing consumption of fossil fuels. I think we also don't know what, how, how, how much harder it's going to be to produce things without them. So I guess in, in the terminology that you're using, that has moved me closer to the Proudhon camp of um, looking at a incremental process of transition. Um, though I, I think one could also make the argument of we know that capitalism is using up these resources fast and furious, and maybe it's best to put a stop to that as quickly as possible. So I think one could actually take that both ways. But um, that's, yeah, but for me, that's a key link to the strategy question is really this just big unknown that we have about how much we can actually produce when we organize in a different way. Yeah. And so I went to a, a, another conference a while ago at Harvard, and it was called Transition to the New Economy. Um, and I was pretty dismayed at, at, you know, in the first session to find that it was going to divide into working groups, one of which was business and finance. Um, I thought, oh well, so there's going to be business and finance in the new economy. Um, and Gar Alperovitz spoke. And all in all, him plus all the other speakers seem to deliver this idea of um, how all of us need to just produce different values uh, all the time. All of us together produce lots of different values better than the nasty values that we have. That was sort of lots of bike co-ops, lots of making your own jeans. Um, <laughs> there was a little diagram of how all these nice little green bubbles of all of us doing these things would sort of squeeze out and create the new society within the shell of the old. I think it was actually quite a, yeah, what sometimes passes as an anarchist idea, sort of, and, and the sort of liminal resistance with that. And I, I, I kind of, I got, I got really, really angry at the conference and I was disgusted. Um, because I suppose I see the need for more of a, and then, not that I know how, you know, uh, we get perhaps beyond commodity production, including the money commodity, um, and I, I found this C.L.R. James quotation, the revolt is against value production itself, and that's kind of what I'm using right now to, to think about. I wanted to throw it out there. <laughs> uh, there was one other over here. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, um, you know, everybody in the room seems very well read in a lot of theory, and I'm certainly not one of those people. I feel like uh, what brought me into this room was my own experience of working in different communities and being exposed to lots of people that I've been really inspired by, by the way that they organize their, their communities or their organizations, and may or may not have read a lot of this theory, but came to maybe similar conclusions. And my question is a very basic one, especially because there's so many smart people in the room. Um, in my, I live here in Baltimore, I have a lot of friends that, um, are maybe like living at the periphery of the city f geographically and um, have a very different background, uh, maybe went to Votech, uh, have their own garden, share some of the same kind of from their own experience of the way that they relate in their economies with each other, with their friends, to some of the principles that you're talking about, but would never find themselves at a conference like this. And I'm very interested as an educator and a community-based artist and person how we connect with people who are already kind of living a similar life but never would identify as anarchists or communitarians or whatever the words are that would be appropriate for me to use right now. And I'm just curious, um, I'm sure lots of you have um, thoughts on that. I'd just be curious because I feel like when you talk about 
how do we get there? What are their limits? I, I see that as a limit, you know, as, as just people, like the walls you talked about, that people have these walls and I feel like, but you're already living this way. <laughs> you just may not identify as it. And I just am curious what other people's thoughts are on that. I couldn't agree more. I mean, honestly, I don't think that it requires anarchists to have anarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, anarchists <laughs> oftentimes are a huge impediment. <laughs> uh, if, if what you do as an anarchist is come to these kinds of conferences and that's your, that's your political activity, uh, you might rethink it. I was going to say something really tough. <laughs> uh, that, that's probably not what you should do. Uh, I mean, th what we should be doing together as anarchists when we have these conversations is develop theory so that we take them into into our communities that we organize in, you know? Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to go in and convince people of anarchist communism. It means that you go in and you identify those things, like what you talk about. and. Uh, you know, like one of the things that I did when I was in Connecticut, we were setting up a solidarity network. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this model where, you know, essentially a bunch of working people and students and so on come together, and when someone's fucked over by their landlord or by their boss, we all go put pressure on their landlord and boss and, you know, threaten them, like collective workers and students can threaten them with pickets and so on, and, and we help people get recovered wages, and we help people get, you know, their security deposits back and, mm -hmm. and shit like that. It's never at never at any point necessary to say I'm an anarchist communist, you know. Uh, and in fact, that oftentimes would have gotten in the way. On the other hand, I think that it's very, very important that we don't hide our militancy and that we don't hide the fact that we're opposed to the existing society. Uh, the kinds of terms you put it in, though, I don't think really matter. Uh, that's actually a very perceptive thing to say because there are a lot of people whose sole political activity is hopping from conference to conference, or summit to summit, or protest to protest, instead of actually embedding themselves in communities and, uh, and organizing. Um, you, you, you both had very fair things to say. I don't really have anything to add to it, so I'm just going to kind of move on if that's OK. Yeah? Um, actually, I resonated a lot with what the last thing said. Um, I was thinking about, um, I, I live in a house with six adults, and, and how much um, like in order for my house to function on a remotely sane level, like we have to function anarchistically, even if um, I mean, in most of the house, most of the people in the house identify as anarchists. But even if anybody doesn't, like we have to be anarchistic in our method of of self organization. And um, I was just thinking about as you were talking, like how much um, a household like that or any household is a microeconomy and and that the process by which we we solve these problems as a single household um, isn't it can't necessarily be a um, hundred percent of a model for a macroeconomy but it helps us start to um, like think about and process how we make decisions like that about you know how the trash gets taken out who's gonna cook how do we you know acquire toilet paper and, um, and and that like oftentimes when those questions come up of you know well if you have an anti-capitalist society like who's going to take out the trash that I was thinking how like well in the microeconomy of a household if if that's our thinking process then that means that that household is managed with like the the least powerful members of that household are required to do all the shit work. And so, you know, and maybe that is how it works in many households where like kids have to do chores that parents don't want to do and there's no choice in what chores they want to do or how, you know, how things get handled. But the, in, a, in a household of adults or just any household where people are, um, you know, where nobody's the boss and we have to work things out together, we have to start from a place of, well, I don't want the compost to stink in the kitchen all month. So somebody's going to have to take it out. And <laughs> There's always one in every house, right? <laughs> um, and you know, and we don't want to do it in such a way that like whoever's doing it grows resentful. And you know, so you know, we have to come up with with what we do together. And that you know, we can we learn a lot. At least I feel like I've learned a lot about um, the interplay of those. Um, cultural paradigms of, of dominance and power and manipulation and, and pain um, through like working out those conversations with people where they're like, you know, I want to create a better functioning system, but like I don't want to do it by myself. And I'm afraid nobody's going to support me in doing that. And 
you know, like learning how we solve those problems working together. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I wanted to touch on the issue of uh, scarcity uh, and post scarcity uh, and what we mean by those terms. And I don't, I don't think when we talk about post scarcity, we're talking about magical cornucopia kind of machine that will produce an unlimited amount of wealth, result, and joy. But rather, um, that would be awesome. It would be awesome. <laughs> but, but when we're talking about scarcity, we're often talking about things that are essential human needs in terms of water supply food, access, shelter, all these kinds of things, and that the reasons those things are scarce is not because of our large and growing population, it's but because of the artificial scarcities created by capitalism and market mechanisms. So Thank when you. I come to these essential needs that all human beings need, I ask myself morally, do I think market mechanisms are the best way to satisfy these things? And I think no, I think market mechanisms have had more than an opportunity to satisfy those questions and have failed, and what instead has been able to do is produce a huge amount of luxuries consumed by a minority of the population. So, you know, in terms of to what degree can we communize the entire economy instantly, I don't know, but it seems like in communizing the larger and larger uh, needs of humanity seems like a really good way to go. And some of the essentials of life seems good, some other things easy to communize, information, right, that's infinitely replicatable at this point. So maybe taking a tiered approach to our uh, organizing, when we take a look at what we want to do, is like, we need free access to water. We need sh everyone to have shelter. We need free access, open access to health care. And perhaps communism is when we've gotten all of that communized in those processes of those social movements. You know, Quebec students are now fighting for free education, free university tuition. I'm totally about that. That's a maximal communist demand as far as I'm concerned. And they're really close to having it. Of course, we have had it. So maybe that's sort of how that we need to conceive of the struggle. And it's not post-scarcity and limitless production, but an end to scarcity imposed on all of us. You're getting dangerously close to a Michael Albert position. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. I'm serious. I'm, serious. I'm, serious. I'm, serious. Uh, I'm going to take one more and then comment on them and finish, because we've got five minutes. I'm, re I'm really sorry, but we were limited by time. But Chris, please. I, I want to try to really respond to the question of the world. Uh, we want not at the same time kind of like, uh, I, was, I was triggered by some of the things many, many people said, so kind of like, that. but for disclosure, I do have a, a, a chapter of the book on, on Derek's book on history and <coughs> economics. I'm going to try and say something that's not in that chapter. Um, <laughs> Um, and and so for for me, you know, the, the kind of world that I that I want is is one where pe people um, self consciously uh, reorganize social relations and society on on the micro and macro levels um, across scales and even international. And that means different institutions and different decentralized practices and procedures in many different ways. And things that um, you know, invert the types of concepts such as efficiency or value on its head in this new system in society. So in this society, efficiency and value mean something nasty, and we don't like those words. And, th and those, those meanings um, are put to, they're, they're derived from the capitalist means of production and ownership relations. And so it means profit. None of us, when we talk about, uh, when, when a boss tells us that we have to be more efficient at our workplace, or um, an economic manager uh, says we have to be more efficient in the economy, they mean by making profits. Uh, so we don't like that. But in our new uh, classless society, we mean we don't want to uh, do damage to the environment, we don't want to do damage to other people. Um, value means uh, social value. What's socially valuable? What has socially beneficial, uh, beneficial um, uh, costs um, and, and outcomes for, for society. So it's a way that we, we care about taking care of the environment and how we impact it and how we use it. And this to me, and where I, where I may differ, differ with Flint, is that I do believe, and, and global climate change to me makes, to me I just feel um, like, I feel it's important to me. Global climate change means that we have a planet of finite resources. And it's not even about, at this point, uh, population control for, for me or anything like that. I don't, I mean, I like Flint, I, I agree that I don't think that's the problem. Uh, and I do think it is like markets and capitalism and all that stuff. But I do think we are at a critical stage um, in, in our environmental relations where, yeah, climate change is a real problem. And, and I think the, for me, I, I think some form of self-conscious decentralized democratic planning is what I personally want to be striving for to deal with the immediacy issue. So I don't think markets are going to do, do it. And, and so, you know, it's this and, and adopting this, just some, you know, for me, I want a classless, self-managing 
a self-consciously organized world, yeah. an autonomous world, um, but that is scalable. So that, I mean, I don't want to say autonomous world, but that just be rhetoric and empty, but it actually means, you know, rooted in local structures mm -hmm. um, and, and syndicalized and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, brief comments. One, when you were talking about the extrapolating from personal experience, there's a couple of things that you might be interested in uh, that you might find helpful. At least I did when I started thinking about that kind of stuff. One was an anarchist sociologist whose name is Colin Ward. And he wrote a book called Anarchy in Action. And he, he talked about things that people did in their daily lives that shows anarchism, you know, or anarchist kind of, kinds of relations present in contemporary society. You know, and it's a very kind of uh, interesting collection and one that I really like. Um, the other is a German anarchist named Gustav Landauer. Landauer was very, very focused on how we related with one another. And he said that the state isn't some institution out there that we can just go smash with a hammer like it's a mirror or something. He says the state is a relationship between human beings. And we rid ourselves of the state by contracting new social relations with each other. Uh, I think a part of what we need to do is conceive of boots to the ground organizing without a doubt, but that's not it. You know, we also need to develop different kinds of relationships with one another, different understandings of ourselves, a different culture. That's not lifestyleism. You know, that's a part of class struggle and it's a part of organizing, is developing those new kinds of, of ways of relating to each other. Uh, there are some unfortunate divisions in anarchism around those kinds of politics, and I don't think they should be seen as separate projects. Uh, I appreciate you bringing them up, because uh, I think that we can extrapolate some about the macro from the micro. Uh, I agree with you, though, not 100%. Flint, read, um, read a, what is it called, Interrogating a Young Chomsky, okay. if you're interested. <laughs> All right. uh, but there's, there's really similar it, it, arguments made within that. It, the shit out of me actually because you know part of what he says is well you know maybe we will get to a point where these things can you know sort of be uh, be um, um, managed through free access which surprised me um, it was actually really kind of interesting uh, piece anyway which you'd find interesting because you're a nerd like me um, <laughs> I think, I think the question is fascinating. There's a Greek economist named Takis Fotopoulos that tries to deal with it by creating different sectors of an economy, where he calls one sector a basic needs sector, which would essentially be communist, and the other sector would be a luxury sector, and then that would be organized in a different kind of way. Uh, I, I'm critical of that for probably many reasons that you might be, but it, it's an interesting proposal that you might look into. It's called inclusive democracy, I think is what he calls it. Is, anybody, is that right, Chris? Uh, I'm not sure what to say, Chris, other than I agree with you. I mean, like, inverting those values is, 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 has to be a part of that larger process. Um, when, when you were talking about CLR James saying that we need to rid ourselves of the law of value, you know, that's actually something that's embedded in a lot of insurrectionary communist texts, too, that value production is, is a problem. But if we can take words like efficiency and value and redefine them and humanize them, you know, we may actually find a way, a way forward, uh, and and a language to talk about those things uh, in in new ways that don't fetishize capitalist efficiency, which we were talking about earlier, or capitalist value, and so on. Uh, I'm not sure how exactly that would relate to, you know, uh, value production, uh, because essentially it would be trying to create a different uh, a different kind of production, and in some cases would probably require. Uh, uncomfortable conversation for all of us, and that is, we're not going to be able to keep all the shit we have, you know. And uh, it's probably one of the larger conversations that we're going to have to have if we want to be well, we serious about it. creating post-capitalism right. and not killing ourselves. Mm -hmm. The question of sustainability, which a few of you brought up now, uh, there's some things we can't keep. We don't need. Right. I mean, challenging uh, the addiction to consumerism is on the agenda. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, that creates its own sets of problems, too. Like, I think that that's embedded in market practices right. where... But stuff is not... Well, but, but, <laughs> but, but it's, not, it's not just stuff. Like, what if, what if we could have a more sustainable society if we gave up suburbia and the individual automobile, but still had nice apartments and trains, right? Like, we have some trade-offs and choices that we need to make collectively, macroeconomically as a society, which are not being given to us by the capitalist market. Yes. I think it's called becoming an adult. Love acquisition, wealth, and behavior. 
I don't want to infantilize it because I love infants. It's just shitty adult behavior. It does involve a process of like mourning for the stuff that we have to give up and recognizing that it's gonna hurt to you know at least for those of us who are used to living in this nice industrialized developed society that like maybe we don't get to eat stuffed salmon most of the time and you know. Don't get Flint started on meat Salmon. consumption. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we've gone over time, but I, I wanted to thank you all for having me here. It's very, it's very, it's, it means a lot to me to be able to have these kinds of collective discussions. So, my name is Derek Shannon. The name of the book is um, <laughs> Freedom. Freedom. Um, if you're interested, AK Press has the book on their table and a bunch of neat stuff in it. But thank you.